Okay, so uh, uh, we're going to spend uh, intense three hours to close the doors. Um, and then we'll have another hour and a half tomorrow. And uh, I also, uh, I guess I, maybe I'll actually start by uh, apologizing in a way. So I, um, I just arrived yesterday. I spent today working on my talks. So I have not actually seen any of the talks yet. And that means that I don't know what you've been taught already. And I'm not exactly sure what would interest all of you. So uh, hopefully these, these uh, lectures will, will be roughly at the right level. What I would encourage you to do is interrupt me. The other thing I should say is that I uh, haven't given this precise talk before. And I've never spoken about this for three hours. So I don't, and I'm very bad at estimating time. So we'll just see how this goes. OK, so it'll be a discussion. Please interrupt as much as you like. Um, the general themes, uh, this is not the plan, it's just a sort of general uh, 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 takeaway, is I'm going to talk a bit about stem cell biology. And, uh, and then I think that the general overarching theme is how I learned to love big data. Um, and, uh, and really why uh, I think that for many, when I, I did my PhD in a physics department, there was this idea that bioinformatics was something best left to bioinformatician and biophysicists should really focus on models and theory. And I hope that you'll come away, those of you who have a more physics uh, background, which seems to be more of the theme of these talks, I uh, hope that you'll come away feeling that there are some really, really interesting challenges for, uh, for people with a physics training to contribute to big data analysis. Okay. Now, more sort of concrete, this is roughly the themes. And uh, titles of the lectures are not quite reflecting this theme. So this is sort of what's come out after trying to write the lectures. Um, so I'm going to just briefly think a bit about uh, models of self-fate choice. I actually call it differentiation here, but it's really about uh, self-fate choice. Um, and then we're going to zoom out from a molecular level to a cellular level and think about how does the discussion that occurs at the molecular level and the discussion that occurs at the cell level, they're slightly different. So it's almost like a sociological discussion of biology here with a bit of science in it. Um, and then, we're gonna, then I'm going to uh, um, hopefully use all of that to motivate why it really is interesting to look at single cells using unbiased profiling methods. And we're going to talk a bit about how single cell analysis can be used to ask questions about uh, cell fate choice and about population structure. And we're going to look a bit under the hood, so thinking about what it actually means to engage with data of this type. That's in the spirit of this being a school. So we should sort of ju just look and, and get a feel for the nitty gritty um, uh, of, of what uh, working with single cell um, uh, uh, big data sets uh, involves. And we're going to look at some pretty pictures. And that's maybe where we'll finish today. We'll see how, how the day goes. And then next, uh, tomorrow, I, what I would like to do is actually probably mostly use the whiteboard and talk a bit about some ways that we've been using uh, ideas from spectral graph theory and uh, statistical physics in order to make predictions on cell fate choice based on single cell data. And it's somewhat more formal. And there'll be, uh, there'll be a sort of theory component on the board. And then I will hopefully show you how we've actually put that to work in hematopoiesis to discover new um, receptors uh, that control uh, hematopoiesis and, and map out the hierarchy. So sort of so some real biology coming out at the end. So just to summarize, this is pretty much what we'll do today. It'll probably all be on the screen. Um, and then tomorrow, we'll spend an hour and a half on this last uh, piece of work. OK. So here's a starting point. And this is where the first place where I'll ask for feedback. How much have you talked about bistable switches in this workshop already? OK, yeah. OK, it's been touched a couple of times. OK, fine. So I'm not going to go through the maths of this. I, um, I, uh, w I, let me ask now a different question. How many of you have encountered a bistable switch in your work so far? Or uh, read about it, or been taught about it? At, OK. Um, yeah, a lot of you. OK, good. So that was, that was my assumption. And um, really, the, the, um, the reason I put this up here is that it's one of the most um, conceptually simple and satisfying 
uh, pieces of analysis that you can do in order to feel like you're learning something about regulation. And I'm going to challenge this very soon, but it's a good starting point. So the general idea is if we're thinking about how cells make decisions, um, it's uh, between making, uh, becoming uh, two different cell types. Uh, an appealing idea is that we might have master regulators, uh, genes which are going to then orchestrate the expression of many other genes. Here they are represented symbolically as X1 and X2. And if these two genes repress each other, and there's some nonlinearity in the system, in this case it's represented by these autocatalytic loops, then we can generate a dynamical system which has two stable fixed points in which either one of the genes is on or the other gene is on. And this, uh, it's, it's pretty simple to generate uh, pictures uh, such as the one that we see here. So what, what we are looking at in this uh, is a, um, a sort of phase diagram uh, where uh, the fixed point, so if we write down a, a, a dynamical system in which we have, say, dx1 by dt being synthesized at a rate which depends on the concentration of dx1, and it's maybe being degraded by a rate which is dependent on uh, x2. Um, but of course, that's the life, that's the rate of degradation, so we have to have a, a, a rate, a rate uh, it has to be proportional to the concentration here. Or alternatively, and there's many different formulations, we can have a synthesis rate which depends on the concentration of both components. Uh, and then we just have a uniform degradation rate. This is uh, uh, equivalent. We can write down, uh, we can write down a, um, uh, a dynamical system uh, and then do the same thing for, so if we, if we use this as um, uh, x1 dot and here x2 dot. Uh, so this would be s1, gamma1, and s2, x1, x2, and we can just absorb one time scale into this to x2. Um, what we can then do is we can, for every uh, point, plot a vector showing the response. And if we have mutual repression, we can end up with two stable points. And depending on the nonlinearity of the system, there might be um, a weakly stable point which is intermediate, so that if you were to take a cut through this diagram, you could imagine representing the dynamics by a potential landscape where you have these uh, inflection points, which are the points of instability, and then uh, stable basins of attraction. So this is very appealing, and uh, there, are, um, there are a number of examples that have been quoted for this. So here, uh, here we just have, uh, have, have some real examples. So if we're looking at, say, um, hematopoiesis, the common myeloid progenitor cell uh, can give rise to either megakaryocytes or erythroid cells where the master regulator is GATA1, or it can give rise to granulocytes and monocytes, uh, and the master regulator is P1, and it's being suggested that there's a bistable loop there. There's a, sorry, a, a bistable system here with negative inhibition of GATA1 and P1. And likewise, for embryonic stem cells, the idea being that a totipotent cell can either become trophectoderm or inner cell mass, and there might be master regulators which inhibit each other there, and uh, so on. This is in um, stromal cells or mesenchymal stem cells, which can give rise to osteoblast or adipocytes. Again, we may have two uh, factors. Now, this is, uh, this, there was a sort of an explosion of excitement that we now have a framework to describe uh, cell fate choice using a set of these switches. Um, and, and it also seems to be very appealing, uh, just go back one slide, that we can represent this using the idea of a landscape, uh, because the landscape seems to be very, very visually, uh, a, a, this idea that there's a potential uh, which defines, uh, which, with stable attractor states, seems to, to resonate very strongly with the way that we think about, um, uh, um, uh, uh, say, say uh, stable states in physics and, and so on. Yes? Right, right. So this would be the, maybe a minimal example, and then you could imagine a situation where you may have uh, 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 this could be a gene X1 giving rise to X2, and then you have a second uh, Y1, which then drives expression of Y2, and then you could imagine that uh, this cascade goes on for a while, and these actually never inhibit each other until a certain point 
where you suddenly get mutual repression, right, and, and, and back again, right. So these are uh, elaborations, um, and of course you could have interactions. Uh, uh, so uh, this would be a situation where you may have a developmental process where two different lineages, uh, the, the gene expression programs of two different lineages can, can occur simultaneously, and only at a certain point do they start to repress each other. Um, there is, uh, do you want to suggest another alternative? Uh, it's always a, I guess, by definition, it's always a bi-stable switch, meaning you are deciding ah, right. this or yeah. this. Right, so you can now, now you can ask, how do you make this combinatorially complex? How do you, say, make it four states? Yeah. Right? Or, or is it up? Yeah. yeah. So if, if we're going to use the same type of uh, ideas here, then you could either make it hierarchical, in other words, you make one subset of decisions and then another subset of decisions. Set of binary. Right, a set of binary. Or you could start to have uh, multiple interactions where there's a set of binding sites where each factor is uh, autocatalytic but inhibits all of the other factors. So we can now essentially extend this out. Um, and those are the least imaginative ways of extending this out. Um, and I, uh, just offhand, I, uh, there's probably examples that people have published of more sophisticated schemes. I think that one place where this is going to clearly break down, so uh, uh, the olfactory system is an interesting one, in which every cell, there's a, there are several hundred olfactory receptors, and every cell will choose to express only one of them. It's very hard to imagine that this type of scheme is acting when you have to choose between 300 different receptors. So clearly, uh, there are going to be some cases where, where this is almost certainly going to break down. Um, I think I'm going to suggest in a minute that we don't have any cases where we actually know that this even works. So, so that, that's going to... Uh, okay. Um, I, uh, just just to uh, um, uh, uh, set things up a bit more, uh, this idea of a landscape which comes up. So one of the reasons it resonated a lot is because it's, been, it's an idea that's been around in biology for a while now, and it really is electrified biology in many ways. And this is, uh, so many of, many of you may have already seen uh, this picture being shown in talks. This is, uh, um, or, or maybe you've looked at the original. So this is, uh, this is uh, Waddington's work from the 1940s originally, um, where he was thinking about uh, the dynamical structure of, uh, of, of a developing embryo. And this, this picture here, um, is essentially a very evocative of the idea that development involves cells starting off in a wide basin, and then as time progresses, they're rolling down this potential landscape, and they encounter bifurcations, and then the cells will commit to one fate or another as they roll down this landscape. And the idea is that time is measured, uh, in this case, sort of in, in, on the depth axis or the vertical axis, and that some sort of measure of phenotypic space, maybe it's gene expression profile, is being reduced in this schematic just to a one-dimensional representation, just to give us a sense of, of what's going on. Um, and there were a few important ideas that Waddington raised when he, when he discussed this. One of them was the idea that, um, that, we, that uh, was the observation that cells, that an embryo starts off as a single cell, which is undifferentiated, and then, and then specializes, and that this, this, uh, this may be uh, this, this, this is uh, uh, going to, this was already known to be a branching process. But more than that was the idea of canalization. The idea that initially the basins start off as fairly wide, and that as differentiation proceeds, the valleys become deeper, and the cells become locked into their state more. Now, all of this is very metaphorical, and it's very inspiring to, to essentially, uh, it continues to be inspiring to, to generations of people studying uh, developmental biology. Uh, just for fun, so here's actually a sort of a, a picture from the original um, with uh, uh, really what the, the very figure beforehand was showing. And here, this is the, the figure before. You can see why the figure beforehand is less famous. You sort of, you stare at the landscape, you sort of instantly have an idea of what's going on. The, the, the figure beforehand is not so clear. So the figure beforehand is suggesting that um, now phenotypic space is being represented as a two-dimensional plane, and here we are in the undifferentiated egg, and as we proceed to an adult, the idea is that cells are coalescing into gradually narrower basins of attraction, and that these attractors are these deeper and deeper valleys that, that are emerging uh, later on. So this is, this, is sort of, this is an idea, and you can imagine writing down a, a dynamical system with a series of attractors 
which would satisfy some of these properties. Uh, sorry? So the idea over here is that the attractors would somehow be a, um, a, um, a committed cell fate. Now, the idea of potency is really a functional one, is whether you can reverse your trajectory. And I, I, th th whether or not this directly relates to the idea of potency is, is maybe is, is, it's not all. Uh, this is, this is, this is uh, describing the dynamics rather than commenting on their reversibility. Okay. Yeah. But, but presumably, from a developmental perspective, at this point, you're totipotent. At this point, you're multipotent. And at this point, you're unipotent with respect to these decisions. Yeah, that, that's, yeah that, to keep it simple. Yeah. Great. OK. So fine. So attract is very appealing. And um, uh, this is a picture from a review by Sui Huang, uh, or oops, an opinion uh, piece by Sui Huang from 2009. Uh, which was again, uh, really drawing, just again reminding us of the relationship between these bistable states and these attractors. Now this is a sort of a stylized attractor basin. Um, but the idea is that cells, remember if you recall, uh, we have an uncommitted metastable state where cells can now fall into committed states. And if this is now a hierarchical process, then once you drop down into the next state, you can make this decision again and again and again, and gradually you know, become from a stem cell to a progenitor cell to a differentiated cell. So this is a picture. And uh, uh, it sort of raises a number of appealing ideas, the idea being that underlying this picture is a, a, is a well-defined dynamical network, um, which um, uh, has noise on it, so there are fluctuations. And that provided that the fluctuations are small enough, we're confined to a local minimum. Uh, and that with, with a signaling might remove one of these humps or push the cells over the, the boundary and cause them to differentiate. Um, the idea being that the, the uncommitted state is somehow a ground state and that, uh, and that um, cells which happen to be fluctuating more in one to one direction or another are biased in their fate. These are uh, hypotheses that have been suggested, really inspired by this picture. And um, the, 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 the further important point is that the fluctuations occurring in this basin are reflecting the natural dynamics of the system towards differentiation. So this raises another important concept, which was raised here, which is the idea of priming. The idea that already information on the dynamics that are going to follow are encoded in the fluctuations of the early state. So I'm managing to say a lot without writing down uh, pretty much a single equation here. Um, and actually, I don't want to write down equations because we could write down some formal equations which show all of these ideas. But they're just ideas. These are just hypotheses. And uh, this is um, almost an idea you could have over a beer. right? I mean, this, maybe it's right. Maybe it's right. It's very, very appealing. Um, uh, OK, so I've sort of already hinted to you that maybe it's, you know, the, 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 this is just uh, 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 not all is sort of happy in potential land. And I just want to, uh, just want to uh, uh, suggest why some people think this is controversial. So the first point, and maybe as a physicist, and as physicists you would uh, feel, feel this as well, is that the landscape, uh, especially Waddington when he wrote this down, really meant it as a metaphor. Um, and it was very much inspired by, by the idea that potentials have played such an important role in physics from the uh, uh, from the 19th century onwards. But potential fields really in physics are never metaphors. So the idea, if it's going to inspire us to do some biology, that's very good. Um, but uh, um, it, we should not be necessarily trying to force our biology to look like physics. We should be thinking about how we can understand biology in its, in its own, uh, in its own, on its own grounds. Um, and really, the use of a potential field, in, I mean, the, the reason the potential fields is in, emerge in physics is that they're really, first of all, tools for solving problems. So potential fields emerge, as it were, spontaneously when we're trying to write down the properties of physical systems. Um, for, uh, for, for example, conservation of energy imposes the idea of a potential on us. So they're, they're, they impose st strong constraints. They reflect constraints um, rather than imposing them. They really reflect them. They're, 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 they're analytical tools. Um, they, uh, they, even in places where we're emerge, er, 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 sort of venturing into the unknown in physics, we're essentially proposing a very specific hypothesis. And potentials are not consistent with certain properties. 
and they are consistent with others. So by saying that we think that a potential underlies a dynamical system, um, we are making very strong statements about the properties of that dynamical system. So I'm, I'm sort of being very technical here. Later on, and in fact probably tomorrow, I will come back to the idea of a potential and, and think about it much more formally. So just, this is just um, sort of uh, for fun. So this is from a recent review by uh, Alfonso Martinez Arias at, at Cambridge, who was really attacking this idea of Waddington's landscape. Um, and uh, he was saying, well, it's a good metaphor, but it's difficult to implement it formally. Um, how do you actually use it? Um, uh, then, and this sort of shows the, the, the problem with using ideas which are just metaphors, is that now uh, Alfonso is to some extent uh, thinking about, not about a, a biological potential, but a, but a physical or chemical potential. And he's really claiming that, well, cells are a system far from chemical equilibrium with no conservation of energy. Well, in physics, certainly potentials are associated with conservation of energy, but there's many places we could use potentials which don't require conservation of energy. Of course, without a definition, these types of arguments make sense. And then finally, uh, this idea that as a picture, it's great, but how do you actually implement a potential in more than two dimensions? To, to get some insight into it. So that's, um, those, are, um, those are, hold those thoughts, uh, and we'll come back to them tomorrow. Um, this is the idea, so just to, uh, 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 th th hopefully uh, you've still been inspired by this picture, that there's a lot of interesting phenomena that could be thought of in this way. Um, we'll come back to it. Okay, fine. So that's, that was just a, that was a, bit, a bit of a taste on the ways, this is a real, real t a touch on thinking about molecular regulation which could be used to create a switch. Okay, if, if we want, that was very, very, very light. If we want to really go and sort of work through this uh, carefully, we can do that uh, li later if, if you'd like. So what I want to now do is actually uh, uh, zoom out and think about, well, where are these switches being invoked? They're being invoked to think about uh, cell fate choice. Um, they could, we, could, we could be thinking about, uh, uh, say, uh, bacterial fate choices uh, under stress. Uh, we could be thinking about yeast. Um, I'm going to really focus more on mammalian systems. And in fact, um, you know, if you go to a, wor a workshop on stem cell biology, uh, half of the workshop is spent thinking about what does it mean to be in a workshop on stem cell biology, because it really covers many, many fields. And I, there's no way I'm going to do justice to, to even a, a tiny bit of this. Uh, I, just to mention uh, some of the fields which are broadly covered by stem cell biology here. So um, uh, this covers some of the earliest developmental choices and maybe some of the later uh, choices in development. Um, in adult tissues, and I'll spend a bit more time on this, that's the area I know a bit more about, um, stem cells are defined as the cells which can regenerate tissue or, or renew tissue during adult life. Um, regeneration is really uh, uh, often considered a, uh, um, uh, its own separate field of study. For example, looking at axolotl where an entire limb can be removed and the limb can regrow, then the question is which are the cells driving that regeneration? Um, stem cells are also used in an entirely different context, which is really to describe the properties of a culture system where cells taken from embryos or taken from adult and reprogrammed uh, by induced pluripotency are then, um, are then kept in an undifferentiated state through uh, perturbation of their signaling environment and then only allowed to differentiate later. That's a really very, quite a different state from any of the states that we see here. There's a very strong similarity between some of these cells and some of the very earliest developmental states. But it's important to emphasize that the embryonic stem cells would only, the, the thing closest to an embryonic stem cell would only exist in an embryo for a period of hours or at most days, whereas in a dish they can be held for a very long time. And therefore the types of biology you could get in a dish could be quite different from what you see in an early embryo. So uh, really, uh, if we're thinking about, so this is really maybe not a stem cell system at all, but it is a system where fate choices and differentiation occurs. If we look at immune cells, which are responding to an infection, such as monocytes entering a tissue, they will differentiate into macrophages, and there's different choices for types of macrophages that they can become. They can also differentiate into dendritic cells, so there's uh, choices here. Uh, and then, of course, there's dysregulated fate choices. So all, all of the above in disease, uh, in tumors, um, really can define entirely new modes of decision-making. 
Yeah, what's not a stem? So actually, I should actually say it's a bit unfair. Immune cells are really not considered stem cells. They really are a place. So the cell, cell decision making is really quite ubiquitous. Um, and I just want to uh, put that out there. What isn't considered a stem cell? Yeah, that's a very good. So actually, the, the, you know, what makes it even worse is that uh, the very cells which are called stem cells can be studied by other people and just in a different field. So for example, epithelia uh, or self-renew, and therefore there's a whole field of studying stem cell self-renewal in epithelia. But of course, epithelial biology is a very mature uh, 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 field of cell biology. And there's a huge overlap between those two, but there's the different flavors. So it's really defining communities rather than necessarily a particular system. And the most important, maybe the most important point over here is that stem cell is really a functional definition here. Uh, and they're defined functionally in each one of these cases in a different way. An adult tissue stem cell has nothing to do with an embryonic stem cell. They just happen to both be called stem cells. OK. So. Um, so often, uh, you know, we were just talking now about uh, this idea that there might be biophysical mechanisms for making switches using dynamical systems and, and the idea of uh, mutually inhibitory molecules. But really, when you look at what, uh, what's really occupying the field of stem cell biology, it's often not working out the molecular detail yet. Everybody would love to do that. But um, real tissues are very complex environments. And often the first challenge is just to define what cells we're looking at. What, cells, what states of cells exist? So here's, a, here's an example. Uh, this is still very simplified, very abstracted, um, of an adult somatic stem cell, the idea being that there's an undifferentiated cell. It could self-renew, into, so it could divide into two stem cells. It could differentiate, and then it could give rise to several multiple different cell types here. Um, it could also sit there and be quiescent for, for a long time. Um, now, just, just drawing this diagram and relating it to a tissue is not a trivial uh, exercise. There's a number of questions which need to be answered. So um, what, can, can we identify each of these cell populations? Can we find markers which we can use to pull out these cells and then functionally characterize them? Um, are, is, is, for example, this base of the hierarchy, the stem cell, is it one population? Or is it a collection of interacting states? Is it an ecosystem? Um, how many differentiated cell types are there? Have we accounted for all of the different cell types in a tissue? And that may be important because they may be signaling back to the stem cells. So even if we're not interested in their biology per se, we may need to take them into account in order to uh, 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 fully define the environment in which cells are making decisions. Um, let's say that we know every single cell type. Do we know the structure of this hierarchy? And that's very important because if we're going to study cell fate choices, we need to know which choices are being made. Is it one cell which then can directly go from an undifferentiated state into five different cell types? Or is it a series of hierarchical decisions in which you gradually narrow your state and eventually commit to one lineage? Um, and so on. So there's, there's, all of these questions are really, and uh, this is sort of important to say, it's fun to sort of dive right, back, right into the detail. But really, in many cases, the field is still debating these questions. And you know, here we are in the 21st century, and uh, the quantitative systems biologists are coming in, and they think, great, we're just going to model this. We don't even often know what we're supposed to be modeling, because we don't know where these decisions are being made, and, and so on. Um, and then finally, you know, the point where, where ultimately um, uh, the biology tries to focus in on is which are the pathways and genes that are implicated in these fate choices. And, and uh, maybe not surprisingly, much more progress can be made in knowing which molecular components are, are implicated in a process than understanding how the whole system is put together. And that's really ultimately where quantitative systems biology can, can contribute. Um, but we do need to have this big picture in order to put the pieces in place. So, uh, OK, so how do we go about doing this? So and again, this is sort of in the spirit of pe pedagogy here. So apologies, no, it's a bit of a dry slide. So you know, if, if, we were, if I wouldn't show this slide and would brainstorm this, I, I guess I could have asked you, um, this is maybe what we would come up with. Well, first of all, we'd like to have a catalog of cell types. Uh, historically, this has been based on morphology or histochemistry. Um, uh, gene expression and so on. Many of the names of cells reflect histological characteristics. The difference between a neutrophil and a neosinophil is that a neosinophil stains strongly in eo with eosin, 
and a neutrophil uh, it doesn't because of the difference in pH, okay, so that's it's a neutrophil. So uh, many of the names sort of reflect some of the very basic ways that we've defined cells. Um, well, that might give us a catalog of cells, but now we want to know their relationships. So we might label cells and trace them. Um, in development, these are some of the oldest experiments, just injecting dye into an embryo and seeing where that cell that you labeled ends up and then making fate maps. Um, in adults, uh, the same thing can be done. I'll show you a bit about how labels are, labeling can be done later. Uh, and of course, uh, this can be done in different contexts, and each context might define a different functional stem cell. So if we define the stem cell as a cell giving rise to, uh, uh, to, to, to differentiated cells and self-renewing, we may get a different answer in each of these cases. Okay, um, what else can we say? Well, um, we want to really not just observe these cells, but we want to really see what they're capable of doing. So another way that uh, has been very powerful has been to take cells out, isolate subsets of cells, and then transplant them into another organism and see whether they're capable of engrafting and uh, regenerating tissue. Okay, so, and maybe they're biased in the types of cells that they make, so we can now find uh, subsets of cells with particular fate biases. Um, we could, you know, if, we, if we're, uh, with, with some effort, and this is when I say we, uh, I don't mean me, I mean the community, um, uh, uh, can define culture conditions in which we can essentially uh, grow the cells in culture and follow what they do. Um, and of course, the main caveat with culture is that we might perturb the cells in doing so, so we have to be careful there. And then finally, uh, we could kill the cells and see what happens to the tissue. So we could use, for example, a diphtheria toxin linked to a gene to specifically remove one type of cell uh, and then ask, what happens? Does the tissue care? Uh, who compensates? Does the tissue fail? In what way does it fail? Um, all of these are different ways that we can try to uh, work out um, a, a structure such as the one that we see here in a very real context. Okay, okay so that's, uh, that's hopefully, that gives a sense for the types of questions that stem cell biologists are asking. So um, now let's just sort of weigh back and see how this looked like 50 years ago. So this is um, it's really pioneering work. This paper is from 1974 from Charles Philippe Leblond, but Leblond was, uh, uh, really pioneered uh, this work in the 50s already. And what he did, and this sounds like something totally mundane today, is he fed mice tritiated thymidine, which is the equivalent today of using EDU or BRDU for those of you who use it, and then uh, by uh, doing radiography, he could trace which cells are dividing and where does the label end up. And this was a way of looking at adult tissues, and he immediately realized that there were three uh, types of tissues, and it was sort of, it's amazing, until the 50s and 60s, there wasn't a clear appreciation, that there's some tissues that undergo regular turnover, there's some tissues that only undergo turnover during injury and regeneration, such as the liver, say. And then there are certain tissues which don't seem to undergo any regeneration at all. And in those tissues, LeBlond included uh, uh, the, the brain. Of course, we know now that there are neural progenitor cells capable of limited regeneration, but it, uh, he didn't pick up on that at the time. So um, among the, uh, this is now, uh, uh, that's just seeing where, where, which, that's broadly classifying tissues. Now this is, for example, looking at the intestinal epithelium and uh, looking at where does the tritiated thymidine first end up, and then over time, where does it end up uh, 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 localizing. So the first thing that Le LeBlanc realizes is that there's a, the epithelium is, uh, um, this, this, he, this was known already, um, looking at uh, intestinal epithelium. It, uh, so this is drawn not to scale, actually. Maybe I'll draw it. That's better. So this is a villus. Actually, maybe I'll start over here. So if we take a cross section through the intestine, the inner surface has these undulations, and these are villi. So these are, this is to increase the surface area of the intestine, and the role of the intestine is to absorb. So we have absorptive cells on the surface, and this forms a, uh, uh, we want that uh, a layer to be fairly thin, so we've just got a monolayer. And this monolayer is exposed constantly to, uh, to toxins and to, to, to bacteria. It's a, it's a very non-sterile environment. Um, so for, you know, I could tell you a just-so story, but the observation is that these cells only live for about three to five days, and then after five days or so, they die, and they die at the tips of these villi. 
So if I now here have a villus over here, um, we have apoptosis or you know, cell death over here. Okay, cell death. And what the blonde found is that the self renewal occurs, the cell division is localized to these glands which sit at the base of the structure. So these are some monolayer, and there's cell division occurring all the way up here. And if you now pulse these cells and trace them, you can see that over time there's a steady flow of cells from the base of the crypt up. So this now raised the idea that the base of these crypts is um, uh, uh, what we might call a stem cell zone, and, uh, and that there's uh, a transit amplifying zone here, uh, which are cells which are proliferating, but they're going to get washed out, so they're transient. And that finally we have post-mitotic cells, uh, which then die. And this, this uh, picture establishes a hierarchy of cell states. And um, if we look at the post-mitotic cells, um, LeBlanc identified that there are four types. There's a panet cell, there's an enteroendocrine cell, which is very rare, uh, a goblet cell, which is secreting mucus, um, uh, I'll talk about the panet cell in a minute, and a columnar cell, which is the absorptive cell. So most cells are absorptive, most cells are these columnar cells. Um, these goblet cells are still very prevalent. They're about one to one third to one quarter of the cells, and they're they're coating the intestine with a, with a mucus to protect the intestinal li uh, lining. And then we have these very rare cells which are secreting hormones, the entire endocrine cells, and finally these panet cells. And these panet cells are interesting because um, they uh, they emerge from the stem cells and then they migrate back down again, and they uh, they sit at the base of the crypt. And they're full of uh, granules of lysozymes, so they look like they play an immune role. But we now know that they also play a very important role in supporting the stem cells. So this is uh, this is an example of how you know uh, of uh, 40 years ago. Um, uh, just by using a simple labeling experiment, we could define the structure of the intestinal epithelium. Okay, so things have moved on, you know, feed forward. And uh, uh, here we are 40 years later, and in the uh, 90s, um, some mammalian biologists copied from Drosophila biologists um, and realized that they could make uh, genetic um, constructs which would allow them to specifically label cells in a particular state um, with a fluorescent marker or, or any other marker. Actually, in this case, this is showing lac Z, so it would be, uh, uh, it would, it would be a histochemical marker. And the, the, the principle uh, is, is uh, simple. So we have, I apologize for the low resolution here. So we have a, a, a gene locus of interest. This would be a gene, gene that marks a specific subpopulation. It could be say, keratin-14 or LGR5, some gene that I care about. And now, uh, downstream of that gene, we have a Cray recombinase, which is fused to an estrogen receptor fragment, which localizes the Cray to the surface of the, the membrane of the cell, the extracellular membrane. And now, with the addition of tamoxifen, uh, which inhibits the estrogen receptor, the Cray recombinase is detached from the membrane, and it can undergo nuclear localization, at which point it finds two target sites, which are these two LOXP sites, and that allows it to permanently genetically edit the cell in which it's encoded. And the genetic uh, editing that, is, uh, that, that we ask the Cray to perform is to remove a short stop cassette, which stops a reporter from being expressed. So once the stop cassette has been removed, we now have um, uh, an active site which has a promoter driving expression of a reporter. In this case, it's beta-galactosidase. It could be a GFP or, any, or anything else. Um, and this promoter is put in a ubiquitous site so that once it's switched on, it just goes on very loudly and we can then follow these cells, okay? So this is essentially the principle. And now this, if you think about um, the uh, Charles, uh, LeBlanc's experiments, LeBlanc was labeling the cells conditional on their dividing and asking a very important uh, question. Conditional on the fact that you're dividing, what happens to you next? We can now ask that question generally conditional on you expressing a particular gene, what happens to you next? And this way, formally test how the state of a cell will relate to its future fate. Okay. Yes. That's a great question. Okay. So, uh, uh, really good. So, if you put a reporter on a gene locus um, and the gene comes on, you'll, you'll have the GFP on. If, the, if that gene comes on transiently, for example, that gene might be a stem cell gene, but the cell differentiates and it permanently shuts down that gene. Um, maybe that GFP will still be around for another day, 
but it probably won't be around for another week. And the time scale over which uh, these questions are asked, whether it's developmental biology, which is slow, or tissue, uh, adult tissue homeostasis, which is even slower, um, is far too long for us to really link the previous expression to future behavior uh, using a transient express gene. So the beauty of this system is it allows you to say, given the fact that at some point in the past, a cell was in a particular state, what is it now doing in the future? Okay, and that, that's really the, 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 that's why this is such a powerful system. Yeah, so, so as case in point, um, you can find uh, a lot of genes which are incredibly specific to this crit, crit base cell, which will then turn off as the cells differentiate. So you can only label these cells at the bottom and then ask what happens to them next. If you find a gene which is expressed everywhere, you'll just label everything and you won't learn very much. OK, so that's good. Things are getting even more sophisticated. This is the 21st century. So in the, uh, a few years ago, um, uh, the idea uh, people thought, well, why use one color if you can use many? And now uh, uh, there, there's a number of different versions of this. It was initially called a brain bow because it was initially applied to neuro, neural tissue by Jeff Lichtman and Joshua Sainz in uh, Harvard. Um, but it's, uh, uh, there's now many, many other uh, examples of this, a zebra bow and zebra fish, and, and there's probably other ones, a fly bow. Um, and uh, and the, uh, the, 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 the general principle is exactly the same, but now we have multiple uh, LOX P sites and the LOX P sites can undergo more than one recombination event, which gives us random combinatoric outcomes. So this is a very simple one. This is a four-color one. It's known as a confetti uh, system. This was developed in Hans Cleaver's lab. Um, and the idea in the confetti mouse is that you end up with four colors. And you can see these are actually the intestinal crypts. So these stripes going up the side are really just um, uh, clones, which are what you're looking at in that picture is a clone going up the side of a crypt like that. Okay, I've, I've done that in red. There's a, there's a red stripe there and, and the yellow stripes and so on. Um, and this is, uh, this is, I believe, in, uh, in uh, neuronal tissue. Uh, and I'm not sure which tissue this one is. But you can see this very striking uh, combinatorial use of colors, which now allows us to follow many clones very densely packed together. So the disadvantage earlier was that either you just follow every cell labeled or you have to label at very, very low densities in order to follow what a single cell does. And this multicolor labeling allows you to increase the density of cells being tracked. OK, so that's one way that we can look at stem cells. So um, let's, let's, um, let's go on to actually a, a, a sort of the, the classical system for adult tissue stem cell biology. And this is uh, the hematopoietic system. So the study of hematopoiesis really took off after the Second World War. Um, and I, I have to admit, I'm probably not the expert for this, but from what I've gathered, and if there's someone here who knows more, they can correct me, um, this really came from an observation that radiation sickness was, uh, had, had two components. First of all, it was causing people to have severe hematopoietic disorders, and second of all, that there was a, a serious damage to the bone marrow. And this made people start to study the bone marrow as a source of blood. Okay. I may be wrong about the precise uh, uh, order of that. But the seminal experiment came, uh, by t this is a seminal experiment by Tilla McCulloch in the 60s, this is 1961, where they took, um, they lethally irradiated a mouse, and then they took the uh, bone marrow from a donor and injected it into the mouse, and they found that at a later point, single colonies of cells were appearing both in the bone marrow, but it was much easier to see them in the spleen of the mice, these large, distinct colonies, which looked like they were emerging from single cells. And when they had a look at these, um, these colonies, they realized that these colonies didn't have just one cell type in them, but they had all of the different hematopoietic cell types. They had erythroid cells and megakaryocytes and myeloid cells. Um, and this led to the idea that there is a stem cell which can give rise to many different cell types. Okay, so this was, a, this was really a big idea at the time, that, that these multiple cells, that there's one cell. And um, they, 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 they then did something else, which I, I don't have a separate slide for, which is they took the bone marrow of this mouse, which had been saved by bone marrow engraftment, transplanted it into another mouse, and discovered that the same thing happened again. 
So that meant that these cells, which were giving rise to colonies of differentiated cells, could also give rise to themselves. So that defined really two major features of a tissue stem cell. It can self-renew, and it can give rise to all of the different cell types in a tissue. Okay? So we, we saw that already in the intestine. That was actually later work. This is really what kicked off the idea of stem cells. And it's really also shaped the way that people think about tissue stem cells. It's a very hematopoietic view, this idea that there is this very complex hierarchy giving rise to many different cell types, all, uh, uh, and there's a, there's a stem cell that sits at the base of this hierarchy. So now the, the, the question is, um, uh, becomes pretty well defined, which is what is the structure? We know, we know that there exists a single base to the tree, and we can now try to map out what that tree is. And from the 90s onwards, there was a huge boost by the development of flow cytometry and monoclonal antibodies, which meant that we can now take a complex mixture and try to fractionate it and look for transient states of differentiation. So up until, uh, up until the 90s, um, uh, there was uh, observations in colony forming acids. You could take single cells and grow them in culture, and that was a major, um, a, a really major innovation. The idea that we didn't need to put them in a mouse to look at what was going on, and to find which factors we have to grow the cells with in order to to call them to uh, to allow them to grow. That gave rise to many of uh, the different factors which uh, were later found to be the real regulators of these cells in vivo. So that was a sort of a major, major breakthrough. But in the 90s onwards, it really things really uh, became transformed, and here's a sort of cartoon. So this is probably sort of too simple, but just, you know, just to spell it out. So we now have a complex mixture of cells, and we throw in some sp specific antibodies, and we can label our cells, right? And then uh, what we can then do is put them in, uh, into a flow sorter, and we might be able to maybe combine up to these days um, without too much effort, maybe up to eight colors, and with a great deal of effort, maybe up to 30 or 40 colors using uh, mass spectrometry-based uh, readouts, and, um, and we can now sort the populations according to their antibody profiles, and then transplant these cells and ask whether they're biased towards one cell type or another, or maybe grow them in vitro. So here's an example of an in vitro colony forming assay. So you look down the microscope, and uh, if you've done this for a long time, which I certainly haven't, uh, you would recognize that as a granulocyte macrophage colony. Uh, and whereas this would be a, an erythroid colony right here. So we now can start to say, okay, well, cells with a, with a particular cell surface marker are, ha, are no longer stem cells because they're already committed to one cell type or another. Okay, so that picture that I showed you initially was a very abstract one. Here's now um, an example um, which is pro was probably thought to be true a few years ago of uh, the state of the art. This was the state of the art maybe 10 years ago for the structure of the uh, hematopoietic lineage. So the idea is that we have a stem cell, it self-renews, and then it starts to undergo differentiation and gradually undergoes differentiation until we get these unilineage committed cell types, right? And you know, you can draw a potential landscape under this, right, if you wanted to, right? But anyway, that's an aside. It wouldn't teach you too much. So one, What are the implicit assumptions in this picture? Anybody want to say, what are we assuming when we draw this picture? There's no Sorry? There's no back arrows. OK, that's good. Yeah, so, uh, so that might be a limitation of the cartoons, but you're absolutely right. There's no back arrows here. So maybe somebody, right? OK, very good. So there's no back arrows. Yeah. Sorry? Right, so maybe with a forced expression of transcription factor or exposure to uh, signaling conditions which are completely irregular, we could cause an aberration of this picture. But this might still be, this may still reflect what's going on in vivo, but you're right, right? So this is, the, what, what does being hardwired mean in the era of reprogramming? You know, we don't know. Uh, but this, right, so, 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 there, so there could be ways of breaking this, right? So that's, uh, yeah, okay. Uh, any other thoughts on, well, yeah? Right, right. We've given labels to these cells. They're very, very discrete. Right? There is this, um, notice that a lot of these labels are functional. This is a colony forming unit that can give rise to a granulocyte, an erythroid cell, a macrophage, and, and a monocyte. This is a granulocyte monocyte, and so on. So these are, they're functionally defined, but they're still considered to be entities which are very distinct. Yeah, what, what else? Uh, 
Right, so there could be some crosses. Okay, so that's, do you mean that there could be some crosses between these? So, yeah, okay, excellent. So this is a tree. It's a tree. A tree is a very strong constraint, right? It doesn't necessarily have to be a tree. And in fact, you know, this, I said this was 10 years ago. The last five years, there have been quite a few dashed arrows going across this. Um, but uh, why is it a tree? It's partly a tree because people were looking for a tree, okay? Because you're, the way the assays are designed is, the, is, is, sort of, is, is sort of looking for a tree, so, so you get a tree at the end. Yeah. Uh, okay, good. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's really, uh, those, are some of the, uh, those are some observations about this. And again, this is sort of important because a lot of systems biology starts from a picture like this and says, now let's figure out what's going on. It's really important to figure out, to remember, we don't really know what's going on. Okay, these are the best guesses that we have at what's going on. This is a very, these are very, very hot areas of research. Um, uh, this is not a sort of a mature field waiting for, for some, you know, for wiring diagrams. Um, yeah, now this is just a sort of a general, I was sort of going back to abstraction here. So the experimental assay can also influence the conclusions on hierarchical structure. And I'm just showing this here for an example, a really simple example. If we say, uh, label a cell and we don't perturb the system, and then we ask, who are the stem cells? You could imagine that in an unperturbed system, uh, this is a proliferative cell, and it gives rise to cells in other states. They may undergo some limited proliferation. There might be some reversibility between these states. Uh, but the net flux is definitely uh, from the yellow cells to the green and blue. Okay? Now let's imagine that I uh, irradiate the mouse. Well, um, which, which cells are going to be most susceptible to irradiation? Do you know which cells die when you irradiate? Yeah? The ones that divide, okay? Irradiation really kills off cycling cells. That's one of the reasons that radiotherapy is used for cancer, right, is to kill off the proliferating cells. Actually, uh, tumors are somehow very sensitive to irradiation, irrespective, so that's a different matter. Um, uh, but, but that's it. So we might, we might now put a very strong uh, 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 sort of uh, fitness disadvantage onto the proliferating cells. And it could be that as a result of that, when we relax the system, there's now a response from another cell population which hasn't been hit so hard. So we now come to the conclusion that, well, you know, actually you got it all wrong, you guys, because uh, really what we're, into, what we're defining as stem cell is a cell that gives rise to uh, the tissue after injury, and this is the cell that wakes up. And this precise debate has just happened in the intestinal community, trying to figure out who are the stem cells, where uh, homeostasis is one population, but irradiation is another. Uh, and that normally this, the population that responds to irradiation is actually being swept out by the stem cells, but it, can, it actually generates the stem cells in the other way. And then finally, um, what are we selecting for for transplantation experiments? What do you need to, if I'm injecting cells into a mouse, what do I need to, what am I selecting for? Any thoughts? So, yeah, survival. So for example, um, let's say I'm taking bone marrow and I'm sticking it into the blood of a mouse. It has to find its way into the host bone marrow. It has to bind, it has to find, it has to engraft. Um, that may be strongly dependent on the concentration of integrins on its surface. It, uh, it, doesn't need, it, it can't die in that process. It may be strongly dependent on the phosphorylation of particular pro-survival pathways. Um, that could be selecting for yet a different cell population. Right? So, so these, and again, these types of debates, they go on, um, there's sort of, it gets tedious after a while. Um, for example, the whole debate on cancer stem cells has been uh, infected, as it were, by this, where if you label a cell in a cancer and see which cells grow, it's very, very different from the cells that survive chemotherapy, and it's very, very different from the cells that, if you transplant them into a host, will give rise to a tumor. Okay, those are different cell populations, and then each one of them is called a stem cell. Okay, so it's so sort of a negative talk about all the things that are complicated and wrong, but it's sort of, sort of uh, 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 making you hopefully all a little less naive about the complexities and the questions to ask if you're ever studying these systems. Okay, so, yeah. One of our experiments, for instance, it depends on the, I mean, you see certain cells that being the stem cell in development and others in regeneration and other after injury, you just call them cells. Yeah, so, so, so long as, of course, yeah, so, so at, the, at one level, and I think this is your point, this is purely a semantic discussion. Uh, at another level, uh, it's important to just realize that it's a semantic discussion because it's not always, uh, some of the, you know, uh, 
uh, this gives, is, it's a good way of generating high profile papers is to be confused about your terms and then argue about what's a stem cell. Okay, so, okay, fine. Yeah, you're right. This is semantics. At the end of the day, all of these things are correct. Okay. But it means that if you're, if you're, for example, switching assays midway through an experimental project in order to test different aspects of your system, you may end up with, uh, with, with very surprising outcomes. Okay, and this has already been mentioned. This is the final point, which is that we, until now, this picture has been balls and sticks. And these balls and sticks really may be simplified as maybe there's a continuum of states to worry about. Okay? Um, and this in itself is, is not entirely obvious that it's true. Uh, for example, chromatin is presumably not in a continuous state. Chromatin is either open or closed. Um, uh, so, so not everything is, is continuous. There are discrete aspects to, to, to cell biology. Um, but, but by and large, we can't assume that it's all discrete. Okay, so, uh, so, you know, so, so now this is sort of, uh, 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 or it's, it's half sort of, uh, half education and half a seminar here. I'm sort of going to set the questions for the next stage. So do we really know this landscape? Do we know where all the branch points are? Is the structure a tree? So these are some of all of the questions that we're coming at. And this is just uh, planting the seed. Again, this is somewhat for tomorrow, where I'm going to be going deeper. I'm going to be developing some theory and then applying it to hematopoiesis. It's just a very specific example that we really don't know what's going on. So uh, we talked about hematopoiesis a bit. Um, if we think about erythropoiesis in particular, so we start off with a multipotent progenitor, which is in an undifferentiated state. And then we know that beyond a certain point onwards, there's some very, very, very unambiguous uh, states. We can isolate these cells based on their morphology. We can actually isolate, um, oh, well, let me just skip. We can isolate these cells based on flow cytometry. So a cell that expresses CD71 but no TER119 has just started terminal differentiation. A cell expressing high TER119 is later on in terminal differentiation. Um, the, the, the profile of these cells, because of their size, changes the forward scatter on the fax machine. So we can really pull out these cells and study them. But if we look earlier on, there's this region, which you could call a sort of dark matter, which is between a multipotent progenitor, which we have good markers for, and this point, there's a sequence of events which we can, uh, we can I, retrospectively define these cells based on their colony forming potential. There's, this one is more mature. This one looks like it might be less mature. Um, but we really don't have a handle on how to isolate these cells. So again, you know, there's, there are these um, points. And I'll come back. So I think one of the conclusions I'm going to tell you about tomorrow is that we have now defined all of these states. And we can now pull out cells at each one of these states along the way. So OK. So all of this was at the cell level. And now let's go back to the beginning of the uh, picture. So what about molecular switches and landscapes? And you know, these ideas are definitely uh, have been very, very appealing to, to thinking about cell biology. Um, and uh, uh, to stem cell biology. And this is just from a review specifically. Actually, Tarek Enver is a, is a hemato uh, hematopoiesis biologist. And he's, uh, he's one of the people who's really driven this idea of thinking about landscapes. Um, and this is just a review of his from 2009. Um, and the review is full of pictures of landscapes and bistable switches and, and so on and so forth. So, uh, so it looks like it's very appealing. But when you look at even the textbook cases, so I showed you earlier GATA1, PU1 being a textbook case. Um, you actually, this is actually a good, uh, again, sort of a pedagogy is to ask, how do you actually go about testing whether one of these bistable switches exists? And this is one, uh, so this is, a, this is a very, very nice piece of work. It's just been published by Tim Schroeder, where uh, uh, Tim isolated cells and uh, put in uh, uh, labels for GATA1. So he has a GATA1 GFP and a PE1 YFP. Um, and he could resolve these two colors. And now he, um, he, um, he can now follow them over multiple generations and ask, what are the levels of GATA1 and PE1 at the point where fate commitment occurs? And now maybe it was sort of a good idea to sort of draw um, what, what we might expect from a bistable switch. So um, let's see. So let's say uh, this is the point of fate commitment. And we're looking, and this is uh, the expression of uh, our two components. So what is, uh, we've got them both uh, at this. So, you know, again, we're in our, um, uh, we're in our um, metastable state here in the silicon flow one way or the other. 
So in this metastable state, we should expect to see some fluctuations. Right? And here's our, our um, maybe some fluctuations, but really too low to, to cause an effect. And then at some point, one of these genes wins out, and uh, the other one is quenched. Right? That's essentially what we'd expect. So there should be a very simple statement, which is a decision point should occur at the point where one of these genes will, wins out. Uh, Tim made a very simple observation, which is uh, if you now follow these cells over time, and this is, you may have to squint here, um, uh, this dark red region over here are cells that are starting to express GATA1 at high levels. And you will notice something very clear, that large regions of this tree are either red or dark. So the decision is being made simultaneously, seemingly simultaneously, by all of the cells in a lineage well before GATA1 levels have become high. Okay? That means, in other words, that the decision to commit to erythropoiesis happened long before this point here. So really what he's suggesting is there's some mysterious point back here where the decision was made and we cannot see it. So this doesn't rule out the idea of a bistable switch, but it certainly rules out the specific players, P1 and GATA1, as being driving the switch. Okay? So, uh, yeah. If you have a switch late, and um, simple interpretation is that switch is obviously very stable, and the other, but you do something before that, right. that means that you're kind of going to be erythrocyte. Yeah, so, so presumably the, the, there is a switch, and, uh, but it's probably not occurring with GATA1. Not, not by, it's, not, it's not about GATA1 going up to very high levels and repressing PE1 as a result. Um, it could be uh, that there's a, a factor uh, like TAL1 or a bit BHLH, uh, which, is, uh, it, which actually pre, presupposes GATA1. Uh, or it could be that the switch is not about the concentration of GATA1, but about uh, the activity of the very low levels of P1 and GATA1 um, already having an effect, and that GATA1 rising is a much, I mean, essentially what, the, 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 is that covering all of the alternatives? Right, yeah, so there's many ways. So in fact, uh, and you know, when, when we saw this, uh, uh, we were having a discussion about this in the lab, and one of my students was saying, you know, this is sort of depressing. This is one hypothesis out of the infinitely many hypotheses for how a bistable switch could be uh, regu uh, implemented. It's specifically that P1 and GATA1 interacted. And yet it took a huge piece of work to just test and falsify this one hypothesis. There's many, many other ways that this uh, bistable switch could be implemented. But you know, this clearly rules out the sort of the textbook model for, for what was going on. OK, so let's see. It's uh, four, uh, five past four. Um, this is the summary so far. Um, uh, this has sort of been a series of vignettes, I guess. Uh, we've discussed um, molecular and cellular perspectives of heterogeneity and self choice, cell fate choice. We've given a very simple molecular model uh, uh, for fate choice based on a bistable switch. We've uh, suggested that these ideas of switches and the idea of stable attractors in general of dynamical systems uh, formalize Waddington's metaphorical landscape. Uh, but that we've just seen now that these models might not apply even in some textbook cases. Um, we've discussed how stem cell systems have been defined by tracing, by transplantation, by colony forming uh, cultures, a bit about the sort of early history of that field. And, um, and we've also discussed the fact that we're sort of limited right now by experiments to thinking about ball by, by labeling cells using in discrete monoclonal antibodies or reporters for particular genes in order to define our hierarchy of states. So that's essentially the, the, the state right now. So, yeah. An activated process, uh, process. Uh, oh, right, right, right. Uh, 
Okay, so in these in vitro, so, so if we were say, uh, this is a good point. So um, if this was purely stochastic, actually the paper was pretty precise about saying it's not a, a stochastic independent, you know, sort of memoryless process. Um, which would uh, correspond to, say, if it was a thermodynamic system, it would be an exponential waiting time for a cell to cross a potential barrier, right? And then you'd expect all of the sister cells to have exponentially distributed waiting times. But, but the fact that they all go together rules out the idea that it's the mere stochastic activation of one of these uh, switches. Now, if it was in vivo, you could argue, well, actually, all of these cells are in a single environment, and that environment is in contact with uh, the bone marrow, and the bone marrow just lowered the potential barrier for everyone by, by providing a particular signal. So then, that wouldn't really invalidate any of these results because, um, of course, as soon as you add an extrinsic source of noise, you can couple all of the individual cells in your system. This was actually done in vitro, and uh, the cells are fairly, you know, they, 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 they migrate apart from each other. So these cells are not experiencing the same microenvironment. They're certainly not experiencing a more similar microenvironment than the other cells in that picture. So there's no argument to be made. This is really, this really indicates that it's, it's a decision that was made by a earlier generation of the cell, which then undergo, underwent a round of divisions. Yeah, does that, is that, yeah. yeah. Sure. Yeah, you know, absolutely. Oh, okay, so 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 that um, sorry, so that is consistent with the idea that it happened earlier, and in fact, that's a, that's pretty much what the suggestion is at this point uh, in that paper is that all the cells are switching on GATA one at the same time because there's a, there was a, a a commitment point and then a delay, and in that delay there were six cell cycles, and uh, but during those six cell cycles there's a clock running. And at the end of that clock, all of the cells switch on GATA1. That's essentially the suggestion. And the commitment, uh, they don't really uh, have, I mean, they know that it's happening earlier. They don't know whether it's a random process or not. They, 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 they just know it's not GATA1 coming up. So it's not this specific bistable switch, which involves uh, the, the absolute protein concentration of GATA1 repressing P1 activity. Uh, what's the re reason b behind thermodynamic? Uh, well, uh, this is so. So this is. Uh, uh, I mean, this is not a closed system by any means. There's energy. I mean, formally, there's energy being consumed, and you know, the energy uh, uh, being consumed is. Uh, I can write this down. You know, in a vector form, right? Is uh, in several places, right? So, um, so this is synthesis. Right, that consumes energy. Right, and then uh, degradation is an active process of proteolysis that consumes energy. Everything consumes energy. So the whole si and this this system is certainly not a therm in thermodynamic equilibrium. It can it can have a stationary state, but that stationary state is not a thermodynamic uh, equilibrium. Okay, it's it's a it's yeah, okay. That's different. It it doesn't have to obey uh, uh, detailed uh, uh, flux in any way. Right? Cell and then it comes to five, six cells in each other, and then it's kind of, I know that people sometimes use it, but I think pathology generates more problems. I mean, it's like. I'm a. Yeah. I mean, there are examples, maybe, that are developed, but something normal. Yeah, so. It's often involved as this Yeah. So, uh, so the idea that it's a very precise counter seems amazing, uh, and I don't know whether that's really true, how, how precise it is. Um, uh, what, what, what you could imagine, I mean, uh, there, are, there are some really good examples. Um, Mid-blastular transition in early vertebrates, where there's a cleavage, and the cleavage you know, is a very precise number of divisions, and you can perturb it in a very predictable way by, say, increasing the amount of DNA or reducing the amount of DNA, which will reduce the number of divisions by one, you know, depending on how you, how you go. Uh, and I think that in the last, uh, f about f five years ago, uh, a very particular chromat DNA binding protein was found, which is undergoing dilution, and that when it dilutes enough, you get zygotic transcription switching on. So it's really counting the, uh, it's really the dilution, the exponential dilution of a factor is really counting. 
Uh, okay, yeah, and, and yeah. It's a possibility, and actually exponential dilution seems like a very noisy thing to do, right? It's very hard to count more than three, right? I mean, um, uh, so I, yeah, so I, I agree with you, uh, but, but it's certainly a good example of where there is a counter. So counters do exist. Um, in this case, uh, the other thing that I think we know about this particular stage of erythropoiesis, so we know two things. First of all, I'll show you later uh, gene expression, and we can see that there's a very, very specific stage associated with pre gata one uh, you know, there's this amplification module. Um, and uh, the cell cycles are incredibly fast. They're uh, like four or six hours or something. So there might be some dilution going on. Right? It's, you're just, just dividing like crazy. Yeah. 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 Which, which structure? Oh, uh, no, no, so, so it's a, um, uh, uh, sorry, uh, I didn't mean it's an assumption. What I mean is it's, uh, it's a model. Uh, look, any, any time that you draw any piece of science, you're drawing uh, a model for what you think is going on. So the question is, um, uh, I guess, um, let's go back. Uh, that's a very philosophical statement, not a very useful one. Um, uh, what we're doing over here is we're formalizing the results of transplantation in vitro colony forming experiments. Okay, so there exists a set of sur cell surface markers that if you isolate cells based on those markers, you will find cells which can give rise to all of these cell types. Is this a pure population? We don't know. All right. Um, there is another cell population which has a restricted uh, set of fate choices. Is this a pure population? We, you know, we don't know. Actually, we do now. So some of these are completely impure. They're just a mixture of different cell types. Okay, so that's an example. This is what I mean. You know, this, this was the best that you could do with antibodies because you had a very, very unique phenotype associated with a small number of antibodies. When you look at the transcriptional profiles, you find that you're mixing together different cell types. And some of the, uh, when you get to sort of sub subdivisions of these cells, you're really just mixing different proportions of cells and you're getting slightly different outcomes. Every day. Yeah, so, okay, so this, this might be a good time to take a break, um, and then we can, uh, we can then, uh, let's see, the next thing is uh, to talk about single cell analysis. Okay, so um, it's 5.15, what should, or sorry, 4.15, uh, because I have a long time, I'm sort of taking the liberty of changing the breaks a bit. What right. time? Actually, so you, you tell me, I can start the next bit now and talk for 15 more minutes and then we take a break? Is that, be I mean, again, I'm sort of, I don't want to ruin the, yeah. In t it's back to back, okay. Is, is, so, so I don't know, I mean, probably, if it's an hour and a half, we can break now and be back at five. I see. If it's an hour and 45 minutes, do the first 15 minutes now. Uh, I have absolutely no idea how long it takes, but because we have tomorrow, why don't we, uh, uh, Okay, hold on. Wait, I'm confused. It's 4.15. You're saying I should continue until 5? The next lecture will be from 5 to 6.30. So there should be a break between 4.30. Oh, I see. Uh, we stop the 15 minutes. Okay. Okay. okay, I'll get my answer. That's, thank you. That's what I wanted. Just, just tell me what to do. Okay, good. Okay. All right. Uh, okay, good. So, uh, all right. So now, um, and now for something completely different. Okay. So now we're going to talk a bit about how to profile cells. And we're then going to do a bit of technical sort of looking under the hood. And uh, then at the end of today, we're going to look at examples of differentiation processes. And let's see how long it takes. So I don't really know. Yeah. Yes. Right. So I think, uh, I think this idea of tunneling between potentials is a very nice one. Uh, 
Um, and it raises these ideas of, let's say, direct it. When you take a fibroblast and we reprogram it, you can think of it this way. The problem I have with potentials is that we're always using them as figure seven as, and not as figure one, okay? We're, we're telling a whole story, and at the end we say, oh, and we can think of all of this as a potential, right? That's, uh, for, for me, I mean, that's fine, it's cute. But if you actually want to create a theory which you're going to use in order to infer some non-trivial biology, then you're not getting there because, you know, you're just telling, you're just, just sort of, it's just a nice way of summarizing some, some ideas. I mean, what is, tunneling means something very, very specific in quantum mechanics or any, and in thermodynamics as well, you know, th thermal tunneling, right, this exponential crossing of a barrier. Um, in this case, you know, we don't have a barrier. We have never defined a barrier. It doesn't mean anything, right? So, so, uh, so that, that, that's really, I mean, that's a very nice idea, but that's not, the problem I have is not that people haven't included the idea of tunneling. Is you can include whatever you want and it'll sound great. That's the problem I have, right? Right, right. So that's when it becomes interesting. Yeah, so that's when it becomes interesting. If you can come up with a potential which is derived from, say, looking at the density of states, and you can use it to say something about dynamics, it becomes interesting. Because then you're, you're using it as an analytical tool, and then, you know, if we use that enough and it, it starts to be real, we might pay attention to it and say, hey, maybe there's really a, a real potential landscape. And then we can ask about its properties. What's the topology? And, and so on, you know, localization, and there's all kinds of questions we might ask. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, so, uh, yeah, no, actually, any other questions before? It's a good, it's a good time to, yeah, okay. Okay, fine. So, uh, so I guess uh, all of this has really been about stem cells and, 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 and mapping out stem cell continuum. Um, actually, uh, that's really, um, what I was thinking about when I did my uh, uh, PhD and also when I started getting into single cell analysis. And the thing I, thing I didn't really realize, but it's really sort of hit in a big way um, uh, um, recently, is that you don't need to worry about stem cells. I mean, I should have, this is sort of obvious when I say, you don't need to worry about cell, cell diversity only when you're thinking about proliferation and turnover. And um, really, cell diversity is a confounding factor for any time that you're looking at a complex tissue. Um, this is just a cartoon from a, a, a paper that we've just published looking at the uh, pancreas. And um, uh, if you're looking at the pancreatic islets, which is where beta cells are localized, uh, you can appreciate the fact that there's many, many cell types in, 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 in the pancreas. And um, now just imagine you're trying to, um, you're looking at uh, um, a patient who has a, a disorder which you can associate with a pancreas, maybe uh, diabetes, for example. Um, and you're now trying to understand where, uh, w what is changing. So besides the fact that you need to contend with, in a, in a human, with uh, differences in age and lifestyle and ethnicity and genetic background, um, you also have to contend with the fact that there's many cell types and your phenotype could be localized to any one of these. And now starting to specifically investigate each one of these could be a, a lot of work. And uh, the worst thing that you could probably do, which is, of course, what has been done very commonly is to just mash it all up and get a single sort of omics profile of everything. And now you're sort of averaging, and, and if you're trying to figure out now which compartment is being affected, you're, you know, you're, you're in real trouble. So the, the reality is that um, this has become a, a very, very, very popular field of research now, where almost any problem which involves a complex tissue is now being mapped. And there's, in fact, now these huge initiatives to map every cell in the human body and so on and so on. Those are the kind of things you, you might want to uh, uh, sort of, you, you might have a knee-jerk reaction against. Um, but, but, so, but this is just a general point, which is that, uh, that there is a lot of, um, uh, a lot of diversity beyond uh, tissue homeostasis. So, so really, this is a general framework now for thinking about how to use cell, uh, single cell analysis. The idea is that you start off with a mixed population which you don't have any pre, uh, prior knowledge, or, or maybe you do, um, and now you use the phenotypic uh, information that you have to do one of two things. Um, well, the very general thing that you do is you try to discover the structure of uh, the phenotypic space that you're looking at. So every gene is a coordinate, and you have a very high-dimensional space, and you're trying to describe that space. So the simplest way you could do that is by clustering. 
And that, of course, works very well if you're looking at very, very distinct cell types, like in the example of the pancreas I gave you. Um, uh, endothelial cells are very different from stellate cells, and they're very different from beta cells, which are very different from gamma, delta, and epsilon cells, um, and alpha cells. So that works very nicely for, for particular problems. And of course, for more complex problems, we may have a, a complex manifold. This is showing a tree, but again, it doesn't have to be a tree. So we can now try to essentially extract these types of structures and then interrogate them. And this data can be very noisy, but once we've got these structures, we can take the average of these clusters, or we can take a moving average along these manifolds, and then get a very good view of, uh, of what's changing as we walk along these structures. So that's the general uh, 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 picture. This is just from a review from uh, Oliver Stegel, uh, Sarah Teichman, and John Marioni, who are uh, uh, bioinformaticians. So, um, OK, so that is a very general view. Um, I guess that. Um, uh, that's particularly leaning towards thinking about having a very, very large phenotypic space to explore. But let's actually think about the different single cell profiling methods that we could use. Um, we've already discussed uh, live tracking briefly, and uh, uh, you are probably going to hear more of that if, or Stefano, you've already presented your work. Oh, you didn't talk about this? Okay, all right. So um, you, you've already seen how powerful that can be in order to infer. Uh, spatial temporal uh, uh, information. This can be done by genetically encoded reporters or by just using uh, vital dyes um, uh, or morphology. Um, we can now uh, fix tissue and then use antibodies in situ hybridization. Uh, there are now methods to multiplex uh, readouts so that we can look at many different uh, uh, genes at a time. Um, uh, we can look at um, uh, facts, which we've uh, uh, discussed briefly in the context of hematopoiesis. And uh, then there is a sort of whole transcriptome profiling. So these are just some of the paradigms, uh, experimental paradigms for, for profiling. And uh, just uh, sort of, I think I've already shown you some uh, live imaging. Uh, this is just another example. This is from Valentino's, Valentino Greco's lab, um, who looks at the epidermis. And by, uh, so this is in a mouse. And using a two-photon microscope, they can, over several days, they can follow cells and track every division that they make. And then you can start to reconstruct uh, full lineage trees. And now if you can associate these lineage trees with uh, what the local environment is doing or with the activity of a pathway, you can start to ask about what is regulating uh, these, uh, the, 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 the fate choices that are being made at each point along this tree. OK, so that's just uh, that's an example. So this is very, very powerful. Uh, clearly, uh, very, very few reporters can be looked at at a time, and very few cells, for that matter. Um, this is just a shout out, shameless. Sorry, I had to. So Stefan has just written a very nice perspective about live imaging. Go and read it. Um, uh, and he's got some very nice examples from work that he's been involved in, looking at zebrafish renewal. And he's, this is now, so bringing together some of the things we discussed, this is using a multicolor labeling system. So now the, this makes live imaging really easy because it's easy to follow the cells over time because they have, uh, I'm sure it's not that easy, but it's, uh, it's possible uh, uh, because now these cells have unique colors and you can really follow them. So, um, okay. So there are trade-offs. Uh, and um, I think that the other methods probably don't need too much introduction. I mean, I, 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 there's no need for me to show you an antibody stain section. So the, the, um, some of the trade-offs in, in, in choosing which technology to use um, are you, is the effect that you're interested in occurring on a short time scale? If it is, probably live imaging is a very appealing way of looking at your process um, because you'll be able to capture what's going on and, uh, very rapidly. Um, is it a very rare population? Um, for that, you maybe need a method which can look at very large numbers of cells in order to catch your rare cells. Um, are you looking at a very complex population? In that case, maybe a noisy method is OK, uh, but you just need to sort of get a lot of, uh, a lot of different readouts. So maybe single cell sequencing is great, because you're looking at something that's very, very diverse. Um, or are you looking for very, very subtle differences, in which case maybe microscopy uh, uh, in single molecule methods might be better, where you can really pick out uh, uh, very, very, sort of very precise differences between cells restricted to a few genes. So there's the different, uh, sort of different uh, ways of looking at this. Sorry, this is sort of very uh, uh, management consultancy-like. Um, so 
So here are where different profiling methods, and you can think about how many different measurements you can look at and how many cells, and there are various trade-offs, right? So single cell gives you lots of dimensions, but medium numbers of cells, and some of these give you uh, uh, about the same number of cells but fewer dimensions, but then they're much lower in noise. Uh, and then there's some that give you many cells, and so on. So you have different, different trade-offs here, and, and uh, there are different me methods. So I'm going to talk mostly about single-cell RNA sequencing, which poses really unique challenges just because of the sheer dimensionality of the data. Yes? So the, it's a moving target. Uh, I can try. So uh, facts, uh, and, and also it depends on your experiment. So for example, facts in principle, you can look at millions of cells. But if the cells that you're interested in are only a fraction, uh, or if you're looking at a very rare population, so your starting material is very dilute, you could spend hours on a fax machine to just get a few hundred cells. So, you know, it depends. But in principle, up to millions of cells here easily. Microscopy, actually, this is a bit on, uh, well, fixed microscopy. In principle, you can also do millions of cells. So actually, this should be a smear, okay? Um, with a sufficient, you know, frameworks and computational platforms, you can automatically scan huge, huge numbers of cells. Um, uh, if you're doing um, uh, multiplexed microscopy, you're sort of more limited in the number of cells you can look at. Just, I mean, maybe with great effort, you could increase the numbers. So these are methods in which you add in one set of labels, you wash them out, you add another set, and, and you then gradually cover many different, many different uh, 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 genes. Live microscopy, I guess, uh, you might have a better sense for. Um, uh, there's a limit to how many stage positions you can look at, and there's a limit to the magnification. Um, so you really can't look at that many cells at a time. Um, so, so, so I would say that with life microscopy, we're probably talking about tens to hundreds of cells, depending on the resolution you need, um, a, a per session, and you can you know, build that up, um, up until millions. So there's a log scale here. Okay? Single cell RNA sequencing, we're talking between, depending on how you're doing it, but a typical number would be tens of thousands or thousands of cells. Okay? Um, and, um, okay, dimensionality, um, uh, you can pretty much look at every gene, but it's very noisy here. So maybe 10,000 genes, say. Um, uh, you, with live microscopy, you're down to a handful, like two, three, four, okay? So, uh, and with these methods, maybe uh, between tens and hundreds, depending on if you work with someone who really knows what they're doing. Uh, it, I mean, this is a real art, this middle section. Um, and then, in terms of measurement noise, um, I guess one useful way of thinking about this is what fraction of molecules do you detect? Okay, and all, everything follows from that. If I have a very abundant gene, then I don't need very high sensitivity to say what it's doing. And if it's low, I need high sensitivity. With RNA sequencing, it might be of the order of 1 to 5% of molecules are detected. Um, and with single molecule fish uh, or, uh, and so on, it might be around 80%. Okay? So that's, that's, uh, that's sort of the, the range. And with live microscopy, you're typically looking at reporters. And then depending on, the, you know, for very, very good setups, you could even detect a single GFP molecule. But that really, that's in bacteria usually. So typically, we're talking about 20 molecules and above. Yeah. yeah. Um, OK. OK, so uh, okay, let's take a break. And then uh, we'll get back uh, and talk about single molecule RNA, single RNA, single cell RNA sequencing in particular after the break. Yeah.